Okay, hi, welcome everybody. My name's Liz Steele. I'm um, one of the NEK, um, Save Energy NEK volunteer group. We're um, a group of six towns that got together um, to help our neighbors uh, be more energy efficient in their homes. Um, our mission is to enable homeowners to um, improve the comfort of their homes while reducing energy bills. So that's, I'm sure, what hooked you all was the save money pit to try and get you here. And also the food, of course. Um, that's always a good hook. So um, anyway, uh, tonight we've got um, the format of the evening is that there's going to be a panel discussion first or panel presentations, short presentations from each of our local experts, um, which I'll introduce in a minute. And um, then we're going to move, maybe move the chairs forward and have a sort of more of a open forum session at the tables. We're going to do it in a speed dating format. And I'll, at the end of the panel, I'll just um, re remind you how that's going to work. So, because um, I'm not sure it was so many people. It's awesome to see so many people. Um, so before I introduce the panel of experts, I, I wanted to um, just let you know that um, the state of Vermont actually tracks energy efficiency um, data as a way of determining how we're doing against um, reducing carbon pollution. And one of the indicators they look at is home weatherization. Because um, it's a proven way to both reduce energy consumption, um, which impacts our carbon pollution rate. Um, we've got loads of chairs here. If people, no, okay. Um, <laughs> um, but it also obviously reduces energy bills if you're consuming la less energy. Um, so interestingly, in the last 10 years, uh, only 10% of homes in the NEK have qualified for um, comprehensive weatherization incentives or assistance. So that still leaves a lot of us um, who are able to uh, benefit from the different programs we're going to hear about this evening. So let me turn it over to the panel. I'll just introduce them all and then they'll just be able to pass the mic between themselves. So first up we have Becca Custer. Um, she's Community Engagement Manager from Efficiency Vermont. And in her role, she engages with individuals, communities, and organizations across the state to help ensure that everyone can participate in Efficiency Vermont's programs. And I know um, she's got a table with some exciting giveaways and um, fun interactive activities. So I'm sure she'll enjoy seeing you later as well. And then um, we have Mark Snyder, who's a Greensboro Bend resident. Um, Mark's a local energy auditor with over 40 years experience um, in the building trades. He's a certified member of the Efficiency Vermont Excellence Network and enjoys sharing his knowledge to help people make their homes more energy efficient and uncomfortable. And then we have Bill Chitsey. He's a Hardwick resident. And Bill is a certified member of um, the Efficiency Vermont Excellence Network as well. And his expertise is in identifying wasted energy, designing solutions, and implementing comprehensive energy transformations. His goal is to help homeowners define their strategic cost benefit analysis to finance their path to net zero. And then next to Bill, we've got Craig Taylor. Um, many of you might know him. He's a Craftsbury resident, and he's part of the Craftsbury Energy Committee. Um, and he gave me this lovely little intro. Craig has never lived in a house which he hasn't remodeled completely room by room. But he's never remodeled an attic until now. He met Bill Chidsey four years ago, and he's been learning from him ever since. So I think they're going to do more of a sort of a double act in their presentation as well. And lastly, on the end there, we have Eric Schultz, which many of you might know from um, NECA, from the Northeast Kingdom Community Association with Green Saving Smart. Um, Eric is a certified financial counselor and coach with the Green Saving Smart program. The program aims to help low and moderate income families manage their personal finances while offering ways to reduce carbon usage through transportation options, home energy upgrades, and tax credits and incentives. So those are the panelists. And once we're done with the panel, I'll just take the mic back for a few minutes to talk about the format for the rest of the evening, because we are joined by some other um, local experts. Thank you, Bika.
Can everyone hear me? Does that work? Yes. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much, Liz, for the introduction. It's great to be here with you all and see fantastic turnout. Um, as Beth, or as Liz said, my bad, um, my name is Becca Custer. Do you want me to stand up? Yes, I would love to. Yes, that's fine. It feels more natural to stand up. Well, kind of. <laughs> um, so my name is Becca Custer. I'm a community engagement manager at Efficiency Vermont. If folks are not really familiar with Efficiency Vermont, we are the statewide energy efficiency utility, uh, which really means that we just help reduce the cost of energy for all Vermonters and really help folks you know, understand and make better use of energy and reduce their greenhouse gases. We do this in a lot of different ways, but primarily through direct support by offering incentives, uh, education like tonight's event, um, and technical advice. So I was asked to just kind of give a brief kind of overview of what weatherization is and why it's important to kind of kick off today's conversation. So in, in less than, I think, five minutes, I'll try to do that, and then I'll talk a little bit about Efficiency Vermont's programs that we have uh, to support weatherization. So when we're talking about weatherization, we're really talking about two things. We're talking about insulation and air sealing. Um, and I like to use this sweater and windbreaker analogy that I've heard some time ago uh, to kind of help demonstrate what that looks like. So most folks might think of kind of the first component, insulation, and we're using that analogy, that would be your sweater. But if I was about to walk outside right now on a pretty cold day with just my sweater, uh, I would feel that cold air coming in you know, between the threads of my sweater. So that's where air sealing or our windbreaker comes into play. Once that windbreaker is in contact with our sweater, um, it helps seal up those holes, preventing that you know, cold air from getting in, and importantly, your own body heat from escaping. And that's essentially how weatherization works in your home as well, and why it's really important to do both insulation and air sealing. Um, and I'll also say, weatherization is a year-round benefit because it also kind of works like an insulated cooler in the summer as well. So kind of the opposite of keeping the cool air in and the warm air from getting in. So that's a very basic overview. I also don't need to get too much into the building science component of it, but I do think it's really helpful to understand how air moves through your home to understand where to prioritize weatherization. So very basically, uh, essentially what happens is cold air comes in through the cracks and holes in your basement and as that that air rises or warms, it rises, and then essentially escapes out of any holes or cracks in your upper story or attic. And we like to refer to this as the stack effect. Essentially happens over and over again. So we really want to stop that effect from taking place. So we like to use the ABCs of weatherization. Generally speaking, you want to start A in your attic because that's where most of the warm air escapes, moving B to your basement because that's where most of the cold air comes in, and then finally C, your conditioned space, which I think a lot of people are surprised to hear that, they think, you know, my windows and my living space is where I should really be focusing. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to weatherization. Liz mentioned a lot of them. I'll just touch on them a little, you know, more brief, uh, briefly. The the one thing that I think we didn't, we didn't discuss was just the increased comfort. Again, I mentioned the sweater and windbreaker. You're going to feel a lot more comfortable in your home, you know, less drafts, things like that. Um, but yes, again, saving energy. We like to say that you, you know, should not pay to heat the outdoors. Uh, that's definitely a waste of money and that's a waste of fuel. So when we can really weatherize, we're reducing that air light leakage and saving you energy. Um, if folks, you know, might be considering a heat pump. That's also um, a great heating source, but we really think that starting with weatherization first um, is really important because, again, your heat pump's going to be going so much further. Um, and then right along with saving energy is saving money. We know that comprehensive uh, weatherization projects can save Vermont households hundreds of dollars per year on fuel costs. So that's another, another tempting reason to think about weatherization. And then again, reducing our greenhouse gases is, is kind of the final benefit. So, so many reasons why you all might be considering weatherization. Um, and I'll just say, I was able to track down some data that uh, the six towns in the Save Eni Energy NEK area over the past few years have taken on 105 uh, weatherization, comprehensive weatherization projects in the last few years. So your neighbors are thinking about it and uh, definitely recognizing both the benefits and the needs of weatherization. Tell me I'm doing on time. <laughs> um, I have a few more just to talk about Efficiency Vermont's program. So if you're convinced and you really want to do weatherization, but you're thinking about, okay, how can I pay for this? Efficiency Vermont has some rebates. The first and kind of primary one is our Home Performance with Energy Star program. It's quite a mouthful. I just will refer to it as Home Performance. Um, but when you work with one of our Efficiency Excellence Network contractors uh, to do a weatherization project, you can receive 75% of project costs back, up to 4,000, and if you're income eligible, up to 9,500. 
If the upfront cost is still a barrier, we also do have um, a no to low interest financing option as well that kind of help uh, reduce that upfront cost. And then if you're maybe thinking about a comprehensive weatherization project, but you're thinking maybe I can do it down the road, but I'd like to do some small projects around my house myself, we do have a do-it-yourself or DIY rebate that you can take advantage of. So small projects like air sealing around windows and doors or insulating pipes, um, that can all qualify and you can get $100 uh, back to cover the cost of materials. So that's what we have as far as programs. Um, I'll just say the other thing is, I feel like probably some folks here are coming from two opposite ends. Maybe some are coming from, I've never thought about weatherization before. I really still don't really know where to start. I would love to just talk to an expert. Uh, that's a great opportunity to sign up for one of our virtual home energy visits. This is a free visit with one of our energy consultants, um, in-house energy consultants who can assess your home and essentially help identify where you're losing energy and, and then offer a personalized list of recommendations for energy improvements you can make. I will just note, this is not the same thing as what uh, Mark is going to talk about, which is energy audits, so I don't want to confuse the two. That's a much more comprehensive assessment. This is a kind of a visual assessment, uh, much more high level. I'm over. Time. That's good. And then I'll hand it over to Mark, just like that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Hi. So I'm a certified energy auditor participating with the Efficiency Vermont and I'm going to try and make a pretty complicated subject simple. If I lose you, I'm going to be in the back corner and feel free to reach out and, and I will answer any question that maybe I left you on. So an audit is a respectful and confidential process where you allow me into your home, and I can see some of my customers in here who already went through that, um, and I'm gonna collect data about your house from room to room, from attic to basement. There's no place that I don't go or inspect. <laughs> um, attics are my second favorite, basements are my favorite, and crawl spaces are right there too. Um, the first thing we focus on is health and human safety. I like to say it doesn't matter if we weatherize your house if it's not safe. So we want to make sure you have things like carbon monoxide detectors, like smoke detectors, um, preferably on every floor, ideally over every bed. Um, we want to make sure your handrails are in shape. Just simple little health and human safety things. And that's on my work scope, which is what I generate, first and foremost. Um, takes priority over the energy audit, actually. So once we've got that out of the road, I'm walking through your house and I'm looking at um, ventilation. Because the goal is to make your house tighter and we need to make it well ventilated if that's the case for indoor air quality. And that becomes so, so important nowadays. The old leaky farmhouse didn't really matter, but now that we're making them tighter, it does. Um, then we're gonna test all your combustion appliances, which is gas, stoves and ovens, heaters, propane devices, space heaters, um, furnaces, boilers, oil, propane. They're all gonna get tested for carbon monoxide um, and um, spillage all the while I'm testing for carbon monoxide in your house as I'm walking through it. While we're walking through it, we're gonna assess the R values of your insulation to see how much insulation you have. Most houses have about half of what they should have. We're looking for about 18 inches to 20 of fluffy insulation, which is sort of twice what people have in their house, if they're lucky. Um, Finally, after we've made sure that there's no asbestos or vermiculite or unhealthy situations, we'll set up the blower door and we're gonna depressurize your house. To keep that simple, it's a giant fan set in your primary doorway that will exhaust all the air. We can measure that leakage and that matters because if you can reduce that by 10% by improving your house, you're entitled to incentives. And then after we've measured it and documented that, we're gonna walk around and find out where your leaks are. All the while I'm listening to you because you know your house better than I do initially and 
together we'll find these leaks and then when you see them and feel them, it's dramatic and it really drives the point home of why you want to air seal. Then we generate a work scope after I leave. I get back with you in a day or two and we review the work scope. So you know exactly what's going on, you know pretty much what it's going to cost because I'm going to give you an accurate S cost estimate and then I'm going to help you connect with an EEN contractor and that's your quality assurance. All of our jobs can be inspected at any time. We have to meet a performance standard, we have to be insured, we have to be certified. It also entitles you to, as Becca said, um, incentives through Efficiency Vermont which range from 4000 to 9,500 depending upon your income level and you can see that on their website. Um, and as uh, Tom Hurst said, it's the only thing you can do really that will pay you back for your house. Um, he also thought it was the best uh, money he ever spent was having an audit. So I'm a little biased but I think they're great. And I did one to my own building. So now I'm supposed to segue into air sealing. Now I'm supposed to segue into air sealing. So I'd like to dispel one myth, which is there's no such thing as too tight. If you were a submariner, would you think, submariner, would you think that your submarine could be too tight? I don't think so. So what you want is a house that's airtight and ventilated mechanically with a quality system. And Mr. Chidsey's going to speak to that. Um, signs of air leakage are drafts, icicles, condensate, mold, and cobwebs. If you see cobwebs, that's air moving. If air is moving, there's a leakage. And if there's a leakage, we can seal it. And that's where your heat's going. And that's what creates icicles and ice dams. The average house has a two foot square hole in leaks. Air leakage primarily is a durability issue, a sustainability issue, a health issue, and a comfort issue. Energy um, savings follows that. I would like to tell you a quick story about my train depot. When I moved to the Bend 25 years ago, co commonly it would be 40 below zero. I could not heat that train station with 11 cords of wood. My dad was a pretty smart guy. Are we out of time? Long story short is we air sealed it, we insulated it, and now it's down to two cords. But initially it did not work because we didn't air seal it. And I had to tear everything out and start over. So after I air sealed it, it worked. Thank you very much for your time. If I can help you in the future, just please feel free to reach out to me. I, I love what I do for work. Thank you. I got some notes to help me. Can you hear me? No. Only with the mic. Only with the mic? Can you hear me now? Yes. I never tried this before. <laughs> I'm Bill Chitsey, HVAC contractor, Efficiency Vermont. I'm the co-ops fixer. You may have seen me around there. I serve the Hardwick Energy Committee. Actually inside, I'm a hardcore 20th century burner man. <laughs> And you know what that means, I know where the dirt is. <laughs> and the fumes and the waste and the poisons. And I'm also a proud parent of two shining entrepreneurs. So I gotta share a little dance and song with you and I want everybody up. Come on. <laughs> now, here we go. Put the good air in, take the bad air out. Put the good air in, take the bad air out. We'll do that again. Everybody sing. Put the good air in, take the bad air out. Put the good air in, take the bad air out. They put so do the hokey pokey and you turn yourself around. That's what it's all about. All right. Thank you. Now remember that. Good air in, bad air out. So I got a few dumb questions, okay? And it's a raise your hand. 
just to see if we're all on the same page or not. Who's got a wood stove or a wood furnace? Who's got a propane cook stove? How about a laundry or a laundry dryer? We all seem to have these things. Who's got an oil burner? Bathroom. Does your house have a bathroom? <laughs> My house doesn't. People, pets in the house, animals in the house. Does anybody sleep with the window cracked or have a window open when they're at night? I do. Yep. Is that about half or no more? How about moisture on cold glass in the house? Windows fog up, maybe ice? How about like moldy, dusty places that are behind the closet or behind beds or anything? <laughs> Got one of those? <laughs> and do you ever feel drowsy when you're inside a building, whether it's at work or at home? Like, kind of like, <laughs> okay, so we all know about what's going on. We got to get that good air in and get that bad air out. So I just want to talk a little bit about breathing. And these are averages or general, there's always an exception. But adults, if I take five breaths, that's how much air I inhale and exhale. That's one cubic feet. Just five breaths. In a minute, I'm going to take about 16 breaths. So that's how much air, if I want fresh air with lots of oxygen and very little CO2, that's how much air I'm using every minute. Well, 60 minutes in an hour, you need 192 of those. So think about how quickly that fills a room, especially a bedroom with the door closed. So that just illustrates like a cubic foot of air. You'll hear about a fan can move how many cubic feet in a minute. Well, just think of these things flying <laughs> through the fan and into the house or out of the house. So a little information about air, what we breathe in, if we breathe fresh air outside, is 21% oxygen and 0.04% CO2. And then there's the inert gases like nitrogen and other gases, which affect us but don't really matter for our, you know, our metabolism as much as oxygen. But when we exhale, we reduce that now to 17% of oxygen, and now it's up to 4% CO2. So it's a huge change when we exhale the, the CO2. So although we don't have 100% fresh air in the house that we would want if we were outdoors, by the very act of our breathing, we're polluting the air and it's becoming diminished in oxygen and increased in CO2. So just remember, every breath you take indoors consumes oxygen and dramatically increases CO2. So I have a little story to share. During 2020, I agreed to help Leslie and Craig Taylor remove their smoky old oil boiler, oil tank, and install a new electric boiler and heat pump water heater. These new appliances would be powered by their grid-tied solar electric PV systems. My work supported their goal of living in a fossil-free home with a high-efficiency, custom-built, wood-fired masonry stove. 
serving as their primary heating system. Naturally, I measured every square inch of their home and performed a heat loss calculation to properly size their new boiler. I also measured the uncontrolled air leakage infiltration and I measured how much their existing HRV ventilation, they had a ventilator in the house, how much that was moving, how much CFM of air in and out. And altogether, that air movement amounts to about 50% of a typical heating load. That's why it's so important to know what that is to size the boiler right. The ventilation audit led us upstairs into the attic where Craig and I discovered crushed, leaking ventilation ductwork. We also found gaping holes in the ceiling, and I'm talking like five foot by seven foot hole in the sheetrock over the tub, and both chimneys, huge holes around those. And there was mouse droppings everywhere. I mean, everywhere. It was unbelievable. Really nice house when you look at it from the road. <laughs> So we worked together increasing the ventilation duct diameter and flow, air sealing the ductwork, and the balanced ventilation performance increased with a larger capacity appliance and better controls. So I am very grateful to Leslie and Craig for taking action to improve their indoor air quality. Uh, their decisions made my professional life much more wonderful. So, Craig, please share the rest of the story. <laughs> I've learned a lot from Bill, and I always thought it was strange that every time we'd get into a new aspect of the project, he'd have me doing the hokey pokey. <laughs> and I thought, to me, that's just, that's just what he does. That's how he gets the message across. So, you got it. A couple things um, first. The part of the project that I'm going to talk about was um, really a do-it-yourself, mostly a do-it-yourself project with an awful lot of advice and direction from Bill. Um, the other thing was that like a lot of families, we started out with one objective, which was let's get rid of this oil boiler and the oil tank and put in a heat pump. That sounds great. That's what everybody should, we, should be doing, air to water heat pump. Um, without no knowledge or intention of going beyond that. So, from there, my, my uh, thoughts about attic insulation were that either an attic is insulated or it's not. And if there's six inch thick fiberglass bats up there, then it's insulated, it's okay. Yeah, you could layer and lay another layer of six inch bats on top of that, go in the other direction and you'd have more, but um, I don't think I'd heard anything about air sealing before. So, um, the, and, and there were not obvious penetrations that you could see from the second floor of the house. Bill talked about gaping holes, big spaces around chimneys, you couldn't see those. Um, so I, I have some notes because there's a sequence to this and I have to keep things in sequence to, for it to make sense. Um, so this is where I started to really listen to an expert and and got the guidance that I needed. So we were up in the attic and it was me saying, do I really need to take all this insulation out of here? I thought, well, maybe if we wanted to seal some penetrations, we could just lift up the insulation and foam around some wiring spots going down to lights, that kind of thing. No, no, we're taking all the insulation out. So that was 65 contractor bags full of insulation. And, and then I need to vacuum this attic too? Oh yes, it needs to be clean. I have some great photos you can stop by and see later. So 
that was the next step. And then we discovered also that, um, I'm gonna talk about rafter vents. You may have also heard of them as proper vents. So it's a barrier between the insulation around the edges and that airflow that needs to come in through soffit vents and go up along rafters and then either out the ridge or out um, gable vents. So those vents are um, cardboard or plastic, um, could be in any condition, and they also keep air from blowing in the, ra the, the soffit vents and blowing the insulation away from the edges of your attic. So the, those vents um, in our attic were either broken or missing or just um, not really attached and not effective. So my next step was to source some good rafter vents and I found some ones that were um, new on the market that were sturdy, easy to put on, tack down to the top plate and then um, reach up between rafters and not the easiest things to install but, but um, the, the best working solution to that. Um, we needed to wrap the chimneys. That involved cutting, flashing, and applying that around the chimneys in the attic, and then wrapping that with mineral wool held tight with wire. This is all before any foaming is done, before any re-insulation is done. Um, as Bill said, we worked on the, the, um, the ventilation ductwork needed to be fixed up. So um, at that point, well, then the, a hatch needed to be built. So when you get into the attic, that's your hatch, and you don't want insulation falling down into the bedroom or the closet, so you build a, a hatch. And so I did built what I thought was a good hatch. And I built a catwalk across the attic so that once all the insulation was in there, there'd be access if we needed to get up there and do anything. Then came the foaming. So this was new to me, a three quarters to an inch thick spray foam over the entire floor of the attic. Not just some penetrations here and there, the entire floor. And I didn't do that, that was, that was a contracted job. And it was done very well. Then we were ready for cellulose, and that can be a do-it-yourself job. If you rent the machine, I did not. That was a contracted job in our case. Blew in 18 inches of cellulose, probably settled to maybe 14 inches. So our, at least, our 54 at least up there now. Um, so what we, and, and also, by the way, the cellulose contractor pointed out to me that this hatch that I built insulated hatch, insulated stacked on top of this board that sealed the attic hole. It was totally inadequate. So he showed me the right way to do it, which is to make it much more robust and much more insulated. So another example where I, I'm able to build things, I'm able to do stuff, but I don't know the right way. I rely on these guys to let me know the right way to do a lot of these projects. So. In the end, we have what I would call a shallow cellulose-filled swimming pool up there. No air moves through between the second floor and the attic, none. Very little heat moves through. Heat loss out of the house in the winter and heat gain from the attic in the summer. So. We're talking about those two different things, air sealing, that was measured with the blower door test that Mark talked about. That showed enough of a drop that we improved air infiltration by 40 some percent, between 40 and 50 percent on the high end of that. Insulation, um, we did not live in the house or have the house prior to this, for a winter prior to this. So we don't have a good comparison on how much fuel was used, how much wood was burned, that kind of thing. But we could calculate the heating demand based on this new attic setup. And that, the heating demand dropped by 59%, something pretty astounding. Um, so we're getting the benefit of that now. So we don't have, any more, the house doesn't have any more fossil fuel inputs. We do not have a heat pump. We don't have any air conditioning. But 
but we've controlled the ability of the house to keep us comfortable. And we monitor that with the thermostats, smart thermostats. In our case, they're Ecobee thermostats, but they gather data continually. And I can look at a graph and see that outdoor temperature, you know, in its daily cycle go up in the day and down at night. And then I can see the indoor temperature and I can see the, the temperature that the thermostat is set at. So the indoor temperature, um, it's pretty amazing, stays very constant. And at the same time, we're minimizing the heat input, but very constant while the outside temperature is going up and down. And it's, it's entirely noticeable. That's my story. Thank you, Craig. Um, I don't know, I'm gonna follow Bill here. I don't have a song and dance routine here, but good work, Bill. Uh, my name's Eric, I'm with Northeast Kingdom Community Action. I'm a financial energy coach. Uh, my program's called Green Saving Smart. I'm not here to talk to you directly uh, about weatherization. I think I've been brought in more on the finance and incentive end. Um, so my program, Green Saving Smart, we're a three-year pilot, and we are basically set up to help low uh, and moderate income Vermonters kind of navigate this ever-changing incentive landscape. So there's federal, there's state incentives, there's utility incentives, and ten, um, incentives from Efficiency Vermont that have been going on there, and it's ever-changing, can be complicated. A lot of folks just really don't have the bandwidth and time um, especially if you're you know struggling with just keeping a roof over your head you're um the basics, these um, often aren't in the front uh, of what of your thinking. So uh, a big part of what I do is just help people um, gain awareness of these programs, uh, also see what programs are going to fit for your income level, um, your tax liability. There's a lot that goes into it. Um, that said, weatherization, super important stuff. I have done the, what's your uh, virtual home visit called? Virtual home energy. Okay, I just did that one myself. I've been in the field with NITO uh, on one of their audits. I've been out with Heat Squad, so um, super important. Um, there's a lot there. Um, and I guess, Really, you know, if you weren't in a room full of experts and folks, I would be the first person to talk to, and I would probably be pointing you in the direction of a lot of these people here. Um, that said, um, I have some other programs um, at NECA that can benefit the community. I've got some info at my table. Um, and I'm a little talked out today. I did a two-hour presentation earlier. I'm going to keep this short. Um, but please come say hi, uh, and I will leave it there. Okay, thanks so much, guys. Really interesting um, information always. I learn something every time um, I hear you guys talk, so thank you. So that concludes the sort of formal part of the evening. We're not going to do an open mic Q&A. What we're going to do now is we're going to transition to these um, tables where all of these experts will be at a table. And we actually have a couple of other people who've joined us. Um, Alison Puyo from Window Dressers um, is here. So I don't know how many of you have already maybe had some of the window inserts um, put into your windows, but a super insulation idea. Um, we've got... Um, Steve from NITO here with us. Um, Eric mentioned some of the programs, fi financing programs that NITO offer. Um, and I think there's some great um, incentives for income assessed um, opportunities for financing. And we've got um, Patrick from Rural Edge. Um, Rural Edge also do a number of different um, loans and financing arrangements for uh, weatherization and home improvements. We've also got the Craftsbury Energy Committee, who came in as a late entrant <laughs> into the, uh, the table lineup, um, and they're here with um, some uh, experts from Greensboro as well, talking about some of the things that you can do, um, DIY options um, that you can do in your homes. So I just wanted to ask everybody who is part of the Save Energy NEK group to stand up, because we're all the volunteers in your communities that um, are 
able to help you or wave a hand if you're already standing just so that you all know who we are. Um, this group, oh, that's really, yeah. <laughs> this group have been meeting every other week for the last two, two months or so, and we put out this flyer, which a number of you may have received in your home. It's got information about um, sort of basic home weatherization. It's also got contact information for um, uh, the key person in your town, and it's got a QR code, which if you scan that with a smartphone, takes you to um, a Linktree site. Linktree basically is a web page where you have loads of direct links to services and incentives that you can basically just click on the link and it'll take you right to the right place on the Efficiency Vermont website, which is great, but it's like a minefield to navigate. So what we did was pick and choose the pages that were relevant for our programs um, to make it easy for you. But as I say, there are a number of us in the room and we're more than happy to um, help you. So just before we break, I wanted to pr point out a couple of raffles. Um, there's the grand raffle, which is um, a free home energy audit. So Mark talked about the, the home energy audit being a great place to start. So if you need to, um, to start at the beginning, then please do fill out the little survey. We've asked for people to fill it out um, if they'd like to uh, enter into that prize draw. The other raffle is just a straight enter your name um, into the hat. We've got two corking sets. We've got some thermostat, infrared thermostat thermometer guns, and um, not for use um, on anything other than insulin mm -hmm. <laughs> weatherization, people, uh, or home cooking, I guess. Um, and then we've got Efficiency Vermont have donated three $25 um, weatherization gift vouchers for Willie's store that you can redeem in the hardware department. So with that, I'll get you to bring the chairs forward a bit. Um, you can circulate the room. There is going to be a speed dating element to the um, Q&A at these individual tables. We're going to time it at five minutes, and I'm going to blow a harmonica really loudly, and we're going to move around. So we just wanted to make sure that everybody gets a chance to speak to people, and the people at the tables, if you could kind of honor that um, as much as possible so that we um, get through as many conversations as we can. Thanks so much, everybody. Oh, sorry, one other thing. Um, we have some free, um, really simple energy tips. So gaskets for your switch plates and um, baby plugs for your um, outlets. Two really simple ideas to stop drafts coming in. So help yourself to those. They'll be on the NEK, Save NEK table. Thank you.